Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks, praise, and glory for the privilege of the worship through the study of the Word. We bless your name. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. We bind Satan all territorial spirits, strong man spirits, all spirits of religion and antichrist and witchcraft and python and Jezebel and Belial and uh, all spirits uh, not of the Holy Spirit. We are loosed, you are cast out and bound off permanently in the name of the blood of Christ Jesus. The saints said in agreement, Amen. We are continuing our teaching on tripod man. Man as spirit man, soul man, physical man. And we have been discussing the uh, soul man and the functions of the soul man. And in our last several sessions, we were talking about the problem of soul fragmentation. Soul fragmentation. We continue that discussion tonight. And in last week's uh, discussion, we were talking about the dynamics of soul fragmentation and how it leads into the building of a demonic stronghold in us and what the dynamics of stronghold formation are. We're going to continue that tonight, and I'm going to go a little deeper. And in way of brief review, uh, I just want to mention to you that uh, the root of building a demonic stronghold in a person is the person's lack of faith in God's ability to come through for them and their placement of their faith in the wrong thing. Okay? They come to rely upon themselves, their own self-effort, and they set up a system of personal defenses to protect against hurt. And when they do that, they are building a wall. But what they don't understand is they are walling themselves in. You see? Now, at that time, it's very common for a spirit of maturation arrest to come in because the person fears, their soul man fears being hurt anymore. And so they increasingly begin relying upon their own self-effort and their own personal defenses. Uh, psychologists or psychiatrists would refer to that as psychological defense mechanisms. Okay, what we see that as is uh, in, in uh, the spiritual realm as unhealthy or unholy soul responses, which are sin. Huh? Why? Because all that is not faith is sin. And if all that is not of faith, that is faith in God, is sin, and the faith is put in relying on their own defenses and defense mechanisms, okay, that puts self ahead of God, and it automatically leads into idolatry, doesn't it? So, so the very nature of these uh, unholy defense mechanisms Okay, that go unresolved and not brought to the cross, okay, end up being the kind of a thing where the person uh, is in sin and they are building up a defense that becomes not a shield against the demonic, not a shield against Satan, not a shield against further hurt, but an open door to further hurt and further spiritual attack. One of the fruits of this almost always is isolation. Okay? And that's one of the things that Satan wants to do in everyone in whom you bring 
brings hurt and pain into their life. Because if he can isolate them in their soul life from the Christian community so that they can get no spiritual input from other people, okay, he can do a job on them. See? He can really damage them. Because he can minister to their soul life, to their mind and their emotions, without them giving corrective input from other spirit-filled Christians. See? And when that happens, it promotes further and further isolation. See? And a lot of people who have been hurt and hurt badly tend to isolate themselves and they want to stay away from the Christian community. Most of the time, Satan uses Christians against them. See? That's one of the techniques Satan uses, okay, to hurt people and to get them to withdraw from Christian communication and the Christian uh, faith walk together as a community. And in particular, when he gets Christians to speak or against Christians or hurt other Christians, the one he will use usually are young Christians. See? Because the older Christians are more mature, aren't they? And they and they see and they discern Satan moving in on a circumstance or a situation. But young Christians in their zeal or in their ignorance, okay, can be easily used by Satan in their immaturity. Okay, and they're the ones who will say hurtful things or who will uh, reveal people's sins or do things like that that deeply hurt other people. Say. And Satan will use that as a weapon against the person who's being uh, hurt and who has isolated themselves because what it will do is it will promote, it will foster even more isolation. Say, because they take offense. And offense is the open door to Satan. Okay? When a person takes offense, they are playing right in to Satan's hand. Remember what uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says? Love takes no offense. Huh? The unconditional agape love of God takes no offense. See? Okay? So if God... I'm sorry. Forgive me, Lord. If... Satan can get someone to take offense, he's got a doorway in. Now, what is the person doing? They don't realize it, but what is, what are they, they're trying to preserve themselves from further hurt, from further spiritual attack. But their reliance has become on self when they're building the stronghold. You see? And the dynamics of it are in line with uh, a false armor, an armor of deception. Okay, remember what we said in our last session? Satan counterfeits everything that God does, but it works in the opposite way, to harm the person. Okay? Now, we know that when we want to protect ourselves against hurt, we said in our last session that we put on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, gird ourselves with the belt of truth, huh? put on the shoes of the gospel with peace in which to stand. We stand on the gospel. Right? In our left hand, we pick up the shield of faith, which is faith in Christ. Okay? In our right, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the word of truth. Okay? But what happens when a person isn't trusting God and they are listening to lies that the enemy is ministering to them in the Spirit? or in the soul, I'm sorry, in the soul level, okay, what they are doing without realizing it is they are putting trust in themselves, not in God, 
okay, and therefore they are relying on themselves for their own defense of their own soul life, their own mind, will, emotions. They are relying on their own understanding, their own defense uh, for protection against further hurt. And in the process, because they are out of the Word of God, okay, a demonic stronghold is building. Why? Because they are not putting on a helmet of salvation, relying on Christ, when they're relying on their own understanding and their own ways of protecting themselves against hurt, okay, that is sin or perdition, isn't it? And they transferred their trust from Christ to protect them to their own self-effort to not get hurt any further, okay? And that's what causes maturation arrest of the soul life. Okay, the need not to feel more pain or hurt. So they are not putting on a helmet of salvation, they are putting on a helmet of perdition. Okay, it's a false armor. It's not an armor of God, it's an armor of self. Okay, so they put on the armor, they put on the helmet of perdition. Instead of the breastplate of righteousness, they're putting on the breastplate of self-righteousness or unrighteousness. Okay? Instead of putting on the belt of truth, they're listening to a lie and they're putting on the belt of lies. State or deception. Okay? Instead of putting on the shoes of the gospel of peace, they are putting on uh, the shoes of the gospel of war. See? Not knowing they're going into war. All right? Instead of picking up the shield of faith, okay, they're picking up the shield of fear or distrust, which is the opposite of faith, isn't it? Faith is trust. Huh? And they're picking up a shield of distrust. Instead of picking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of truth, Ephesians 6 says, they are picking up the sword of the unholy spirit, which is the word of lies. And they're walking in lies and they're lying to themselves and they are believing the lie. They are putting their faith not in the truth, not in Christ. They are putting their faith in the lie. See? Okay? And they are walking in the lie. So this false armor of God that they are putting on does not quench every fiery dart of the enemy as uh, the full armor of God permits. Okay, this false armor of self, rather, I said God, the false armor of self, okay, does just the opposite. It opens them up to the fiery darts of the enemy. It opens them up to further spiritual attack. Further spiritual attack creates more hurt, more hurt creates more isolation, and the wall builds up further, the isolation builds up further, the need to rely on self builds up further. So what is building here? A demonic stronghold. Can you see that? And that's the mechanism by which that occurs. Okay? So lies are used for protection. It doesn't work. See? They're using lies. They're lying to themselves, okay, in order to try to protect themselves, not recognizing that they're putting their faith in lies. Okay? And that's how a stronghold builds, by putting your faith in lies. Okay? Why? Because the stronghold is first and foremost a bondage to ideas, isn't it? That's where it builds up, is in our mind, in our thought life. It's a bondage to ideas. Okay? That's the reason why Paul says in Corinthians, take every thought captive to Christ and cast down every vain imagination. Take every thought captive to Christ. See? Now, what does he mean by that? Well, in our minds, we hear three voices. We hear the voice of God, we hear our own voice, and we hear the voice of 
what's going under the buttons when they talk to us and our thoughts. Okay? Now, our own voice is under the control of our will, isn't it? So we know when we are uh, uh, speaking in our thought life because we initiate the thoughts. Okay? Now, the uh, uh, voice of God is clear because it is always accompanied by the witness of the Spirit, how which is a word of knowledge, and the peace of the Spirit. We have a peace about what we're hearing. And God, and thirdly, God never says anything contrary to his word, which is why you have to learn the word of God. See? So you judge when it's God's voice by those three things, the witness of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is the fruit there, is the witness there, and is the content there, is the content Bible. And if it is, that's God's voice. Okay? And then we have another kind of thought that comes into our mind, and that is what's called by many uh, uh, Bible scholars the drop-in. It just sort of comes out of nowhere and it says something. Okay? And usually when it's satanic, it will be, or demonic, it will be contrary to the Word of God, number one. Okay? Number two... Uh, it will usually urge to act without reason or thinking. Okay? And number three, when the demons or the devil himself speak in our thought life, he usually uses the first person singular pronoun I, so that you will believe that it is you who is thinking it. Okay? But one of the clues to the fact that it isn't you is that it just drops in out of nowhere. In other words, it was not initiated by your will. See? It was not initiated by your will, which means that that puts you in a position, okay, when Paul says, take every thought captive to Christ, cast down every vain imagination. Okay? You must understand that that thought is a seed. Okay? And that Satan may be trying to plant a seed in your thought life. So if it was not initiated by your will and just dropped in, puts you in a position now where you have to decide, is this God or is this the enemy? Okay? If you have a disquiet about it, and it doesn't make you feel good, what you heard, that's the Holy Spirit witnessing to your spirit, telling you it's the enemy. Huh? If it's contrary to the Word of God, that's the enemy. Right? Okay? If it urges you to act, okay, that's the enemy, because the Holy Spirit never urges. The Holy Spirit gently leads. Okay? I know of only one time in my personal life where the Holy Spirit urged me to move quickly and, and, and obey Him. And that was a medical emergency in which a little child was choking. And I was outside in the pattern. It was pouring rain. And the Holy Spirit urged me and said, go in the house now. Go in the house now. And I, I wouldn't go in the house because I didn't want to get soaked. And he said, go in the house now. And I didn't want to get out. And then the third time he said, go in the house now. And I got up frustrated. And I got soaking wet because the downpour was tremendous. And I walked into my sister-in-law's house drenching wet. And she casually began talking. And her little six-year-old boy was sitting in the chair listening to us talk. And all of a sudden, within 15 seconds of my being in the house, he jumped up and started running around in a circle with his head down. And I didn't know why he was doing that. And I looked, you know, and it was peculiar that he should be doing that. And all of a sudden, he looked up and he grabbed his throat and his face was purple. He wasn't getting air. And I realized he was choking. And the Holy Spirit knew what was happening, what was going to happen. So, and he was urging me in the car, get in the, go in the house, go in the house. And I quickly took him and did a Heimlich maneuver where I put his back to my belly, put my arms around his belly, my fist, clenched my two hands together, and his belly 
with uh, around his belly uh, quickly, and I pushed in like that, and the bolt came flying out of his mouth. So he had a bolt in his mouth. He was playing around, and he aspirated it into his windpipe and obstructed his airway, and he couldn't breathe. So in the Holy Spirit, no, and it's the only time in my life where the Holy Spirit urged me to make a move. And so I think that the Holy Spirit gently leads in almost all instances except medical or other emergencies, say, where there is a need for, for rapid action. Okay, but keep, keep in mind that if you don't, you're not around in a circumstance of an emergency or anything like that, okay, and you're hearing stuff that's urging you to do something for no reason at all, it is not the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's the enemy. Because the enemy wants you to act first without reasoning, okay, and make a mistake or an error, or make it cost you something so that you pay the price afterward. See? Deception. Lies. And that's what I mean by listening to the lie. It's a very, very important concept. That's why Paul says, take every thought captive to Christ. So when one of these things drop into your thought life, do you let a stronghold build? By listening to a lie and responding to a lie? No. What do you do? You say, I rebuke that in Christ Jesus' name. Or I bind you, Spirit, and I cast you out in Christ Jesus' name. I don't receive that in Christ Jesus' name. See, that's what Paul's talking about. Or I take that captive to Christ in Christ Jesus' name. That's what Paul is talking about when he says, cast down every vain, every useless imagination. That's what vain means, useless. Okay? So, when we use lies for protection, okay, what is going to happen is since you're relying on self, or the person is relying on self, and listening to a lie, okay, it ultimately fails because there's no truth in it, okay? And because it ultimately fails because there's no truth in it, and it gets harder and harder to use your own self-effort to control the things that are happening around you, you put more attention and more behavior into trying to control your circumstances so the circumstances end up uh, creating more compulsive behavior in the person. So it leads into compulsive behavior to try to control everything that's happening around you. Say, okay, so... Faulty protection leads to compulsive behaviors as truth tries to break through. Okay? The Holy Spirit will always try to bring truth to the circumstance. Okay? And as that truth tries to break through, the person who is unsure on their trust or willingness to trust the Holy Spirit reacts firstly with an increased compulsion to try to protect the status quo, to keep things as they are for fear that the walls will break down and they'll receive more hurt. See how it works? Okay, it's an unhealthy and an unholy way of living and an unholy defense. Okay? Against hurt. It doesn't work. Okay? It doesn't work. So compulsion to control the circumstances and the situation then leads to obsession. And obsession leads to spiritual imprisonment because they come into bondage to ideas. See? The very ideas that they are believing in will work for them okay, are so deceptive that it brings them into bondage behavior-wise. Say, well, so far it's worked. Why should, I, why should I go that way? Yeah, there may be some truth in that, but I'm, I'm afraid that something may happen. 
see? What is the problem? One is unbelief, okay, that God cares to help, okay? And two, it's listening to the lie, okay? And three, it's distrusting the Holy Spirit to come through for them. See, so the whole foundation of the building of a stronghold is based on listening to lies, okay, distrust of the Holy Spirit, okay, and uh, untruths, see, it doesn't work. Okay, all it does is it opens the door for further spiritual attack and the use of um, self-reliance, self-righteousness, okay, uh, to build a stronghold. I'm willing to say, and, uh, and I say this loosely, I'm willing to quote unquote bet. I'm not a gambler, okay, and I don't believe in gambling, but I'm, uh, I'm using that loosely. Okay, I'm willing to bet that almost all demonic strongholds in certain areas of a person's life, okay, are rooted in distrust of the Holy Spirit, okay, or unbelief or disbelief, okay, or fear. All right? Because fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is what gives rise to distrust, isn't it? So the root of it all is fear, isn't it? Okay? Fear is the root. Okay? And that will lead to spiritual imprisonment, to ideas, and that's what bondage is. Huh? Why? Because it's sin, isn't it? All that is not of faith is sin. And the scripture said, and Paul said in Romans, okay, he who sins becomes the slave of sin. Right? Okay, that's the bondage, isn't it? All right? But that slavery, more often than not, is not just a behavior, because the behavior is an action upon an idea, isn't it? So the real problem is to deal with the stronghold, which is the idea that gives rise to the behavior. Therefore, in, in counseling, okay, and in witnessing and ministering to others who are in bondage, okay, we must bring them into a discussion of their ideas and what they believe, okay, as truth, and then witness to them the truth of the word, because if we are to tear down the strongholds, we have to bring truth to the situation. We have to bring light to the situation, don't we? Because the scripture says the light dispels the darkness. Huh? Okay? So we have to break down the stronghold by ministering the truth in love. That's the formula. Tell them the truth in love. See? But the implication is, but tell them the truth. See? Now, one of the other things you can do to, to start breaking down the idea of the, tr of, uh, uh, of the stronghold or the truth is to show them what has been the fruit of this. Has the fruit of this been constructive to your life, or has the fruit of this been destructive to your life? Jesus says, you judge something if it be of God by the fruit. And most of them will admit that it's been destructive. See? And then you can say to them, well, if that's destructive to you, okay, that means it's not working. And if something is not working, why hold on to it? Can we agree that it's time to let it go and to do something else? more constructive. You see? And, and what you're doing there is bringing a revelation to them, the truth of the fact that what they are doing is destroying them. See? And by so doing, bringing to them now new revelation, 
that the Holy Spirit is able to bring light to the circumstance, to bring truth to the circumstance, because revelation brings transformation. Revelation brings change. And that's how that stronghold will be torn down. And it may take persistence. Okay? And in sessions like this, when you do minister to these people, very often you will discover that one of the tricks of the enemy is to get them to talk about other things. Get them off of the conversation. Get them off of the point and start talking about other things or changing the subject. Okay? And by the Holy Spirit, you bring them right back to the truth. You bring them right back to confrontation of the circumstance. You bring them right back to discussing uh, what they are doing, you see? And if they're in denial, uh, you know, you can cause them to face themselves, see? You can say something, for, inst for instance, to them like, well, this kind of thing happens to uh, lots of people and to lots of Christians. And even though it happens to lots of Christians, okay, they don't seem to respond to it the way you seem to respond to it. So what is it about you that makes you behave that way when others don't behave that way? See, you've got to get them to face themselves because Lamentations 3.40 says, let us examine our ways. So you see? So that's another part of bringing down the stronghold is getting them to face the truth of what's happening, that it's destructive, and that it's their ways, the way they are reacting to their circumstance, the things they are believing in, okay, which are false, that don't work, okay? The walls that they are building to try to protect themselves against more hurt, that these are the things that are not healthy, that are destroying them in their relationship with God and their faith walk, and it doesn't work, and that's their ways. Huh? And that it's time to change something if it isn't working. Why hold on to it? So you've got to get them to question. See? So you, you tear down the strong. Remember, the stronghold is an idea that brings them in bondage. Okay? And you've got, them, you've got to get them to question their ways. You've got to get them to question the truth of what they believe. You see? And you've got to get them to recognize whether what they are doing is fruitful or damaging. Okay? And then you've got to get them to ask themselves or recognize, well, if this isn't working, why hold on to it? You see? Because your whole of ministry by the Holy Spirit to this soul life, to this stronghold, okay, is to destroy the power of the idea. To destroy the power that the idea has on them to grip them and to hold them and to uh, elicit from them a response of belief and trust in that idea. To destroy that. Destroy the idea, okay, and the belief in the idea, and you destroy the stronghold. Say, destroy the lie, and you destroy the stronghold. Say, give them the truth and love to destroy the lie. Help them to understand that God's plan for their life is better than their plan, that God's way is better than their way. You see, that God's word applied to their circumstance will always work, but their way alone without God's word will never work. You see, only when you show them these different avenues of understanding does the power of the idea fall, okay? And when the power of the idea falls, they lose interest in acting upon it, see? They lose interest in continuing the behavior, okay? And they then the will changes toward turning towards something better. Okay, why? Because you are giving them hope for a solution. 
You are giving them hope, okay, that there is a resolution. They don't have to keep going on like this. They're getting exhausted. They're getting more compulsive, and that compulsion is leading to more obsessive behavior. And they get burned out, and it doesn't work, and they crash. See? Now, once they crash, God can pick them up, okay? But it's a long and hard road back, okay? And if you can get them to just trust, okay, and turn from their own ways and rely on the Word and on the revelation of the Word and on the Holy Spirit and will to trust the Holy Spirit even if he doesn't, even if the person doesn't feel like it. God will work with that. See, God doesn't care what their feelings are because God knows the feelings cannot be trusted. Right? God cares what is their will. What are they setting their heart on? Okay? And if they are willing to trust Him, whether they feel it or not, God will work with that. God will meet every person at their own level of faith. That's why Jesus said, uh, if you have uh, faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, be uprooted and cast into the sea, and you will have, or you will say to the mulberry tree, and you will have what you say, whatsoever you say. say. In other words, all that is needed, okay, is mustard seed faith. Now, be prepared for the attack of the enemy here. Okay? Because the enemy is going to say to them, oh, you don't have enough faith. I don't, he doesn't say that you don't have enough faith. What the enemy says is the first person singular pronoun I. I don't have enough faith. And then they put their faith in that idea. They put their, because that's all they see, they respond by habit. That's all they've been doing in the operation of a stronghold has been responding by habit, listening to the enemy, okay? And if they verbalize that, you know, I don't have enough faith, you just turn right around and you bring the truth to that lie. And you say, uh-uh, the Holy Spirit says in the Scripture, to each is given a measure of faith. You've already got it, God gave it to you. Now use it. Use your will. The faith is there because the Scripture cannot lie. You see, disarm the lie with the truth. That's the point. See, disarm the lie with the truth. Okay? Or another way you can do it is recognize that the Scripture says the Word of God is living and active. Living and active. In other words, the Word of God has an anointing on it. Okay? And you can bring them... Okay, to uh, Romans where it says to each is given a measure of faith and have them uh, read it. And then when they read it, it says to each is given a measure of faith. You turn around to them and you say to each, does that include you? They've got to say yes, don't they? They've got to. Huh? Okay? And if they say, well, yeah, but I don't know, or something like that, you turn around and you say to them, well, are you calling God a liar? You think God would be like you? Okay. You see? And what you do is you totally and regularly and completely and repetitively bring truth to the circumstance. Okay? To destroy the idea. See how it's done? You're... Be led, and before you go into any ministry with anyone, always yield to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you do the ministry in me and through me. I trust you for it. Yield and trust. You're the empty vessel. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit does the ministry through you. Say, you're divinely possessed. Everything has to be done by divine possession. And divine possession is a matter of yielding and trusting the Holy Spirit. Saying to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, take over. I yield to you. You know, live your life in me and through me. I trust you to manifest in this session. And he will. He's faithful. He will 100% of the time. You know, we've never had a counseling session in this ministry. And we do a lot of restoration 
counseling, healing counseling, deliverance counseling in this ministry, and we do it all under divine possession by the Holy Spirit. We've seen amazing things in our sessions. Amazing things. You know, hidden things that the Holy Spirit brought out that, that people were not dealing with. Okay? And, and sometimes we've seen immediate or almost immediate healings and deliverances from those revelations. See? And how has that happened? By yielding to the Holy Spirit at the beginning of every session, trusting Him, inviting Him into the circumstance to take over. See? In doing it. Okay? All right. So, now, let's go a little farther or a little deeper now about how the truth is brought to the light or, or, or is brought to the circumstance. Recognize that when the person has a demonic stronghold, okay, the root of that stronghold is sin or a sinful response. Okay? Jesus said in Matthew 3, put the axe to the root. The axe is the anointing. Isaiah 10.27 says, the anointing destroys the yoke. The anointing destroys the bondage. Okay? So what you have to do is to bring the anointing to the circumstance in the form of the word, in the form of the truth, Okay? Or in the form of the laying out of hands, the ministry of impartation. Okay? For healing or deliverance. Okay? Or, or the uh, casting out of demons. But you must bring the anointing to the circumstance. That's putting the axe to the root. Okay? But before you can do that, okay, you must first determine the root. Because the stronghold is bad fruit. Huh? Jesus says, a good tree bringeth forth good fruit. A bad tree bringeth forth bad fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Okay? So a bad fruit has a bad root. Okay? I'll say that again. A bad fruit has a bad root. Now, these bad fruits are usually in four categories. Okay? Sins of the flesh, sins of the thought life, sins of the heart, or sins of the tongue. Almost all of them can be traced to one or more of those four categories. Okay? Any or all of those four categories give rise to an idea. Okay? And that idea gives rise to an action, a sinful action, Okay? And that sinful action gives rise to a bondage. See how it works? Okay? Now, very often, okay, the root of that bad fruit of sins of the flesh, thought, life, heart, or tongue, that's the bad fruit, Okay, the root of that is usually a reaction to something which offends or hurts, okay, or rejects. It will be rooted in offense or rejection, okay, or hurt or insult or self-will. Okay? Or curios sinful curiosity or sinful experimentation. Okay? Hurt, offense, negative emotions, rejections, sinful curiosities, sinful experimentations, self-will. Okay? 
most of them have to do with offense or rejection, okay, or hurt, okay, or self-will. Those are the four of the seven or eight that I mentioned. Those are the four biggies, okay? And when there is an offense or a hurt, I'm going to use this as an example, okay, that will lead, that's a, uh, uh, a root. It will give rise to a fruit, which is a sinful thought, okay, like unforgiveness or bitterness, okay, or anger or resentment, and that gives rise to the bitter root judgment, right? That person is no good. I don't want anything to do with them anymore. Okay? All right? And what does that give rise to? Unforgiveness. I'm not going to... See, the bitter root judgment of another person, okay, because that person made them hurt and bitter. Oh, he's no good. I don't want anything to do with him anymore. No, I'm not going to forgive him. And they walk away, okay, and that bitter root judgment almost always leads to unforgiveness. See? Okay? Now, what is the issue there? Okay? There is the action which leads to the bondage. The unforgiveness becomes the bondage, doesn't it? Right? Because it says in the Scripture, if you will not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you. Say, Okay? Now, the real problem there is that the demons jockey the person around, okay, to displace their attention from themselves to the other person. See, they're judging the other. And all of their responses are unholy because they are based on the judgment of the other, right? Okay? Now, why are they unholy? Because Jesus said, okay... Uh, do not get the splinter out of the eye of your opponent until you get the log out of your own. What was he saying? He was saying judgment begins with the house of God. Right? Who is the house of God? You. <laughs> right? Me. So we have to judge ourselves first. Okay? Before we judge others. Okay? But if we take the other route, and instead of judging uh, ourselves first, we judge others first, okay? We have just seeded the beginning of the stronghold, haven't we? Okay? Because we have responded to an offense or something that has to do with hurt or rejection, okay? Or offense or self-will. That is the root gives rise to the fruit, which is either the sin of the flesh, tongue, thought life, or heart, which gives rise to a reaction, uh, okay, a negative emotion, uh, like bitterness or anger or resentment toward a person, which gives rise to an action, which is a judgment of them. You know, they're no good. I'm not going to have anything to do with them anymore. Okay, which gives rise to uh, a bondage, unforgiveness. Say, it'll always lead into a bondage, a sinful response that'll bring a bondage. And the fruit of that is usually unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, anger, hate, spite, some negative emotion. See? Okay, those are the bondages. Those will lead to spiritual imprisonment. Okay? And when they are spiritually imprisoned, guess what happens? When they're spiritually imprisoned, they go uh, into further bondage because Satan has raised a false shield. They think they're protected by a shield of faith, but their faith isn't in the Holy Spirit to heal and protect them. Their faith is in their reliance upon themselves in their own ways to protect against further hurt. Okay? So what is that? That's a false shield. Okay? And it, they raise it up. And instead of protecting them 
uh, against uh, further spiritual attack. Uh, instead of protecting them uh, uh, against uh, the enemy, it opens them up to the enemy, and that very shield they are raising wells them in with the enemy. They, they are, they're walling themselves in, okay, with the enemy on their side of the wall. Okay, and they built this wall up so they can't go forward with God, can they? So, and that's how a demonic stronghold builds. Okay, so they spiritually imprison themselves because of their own sin, and in the process of doing so, okay, shoot themselves in the foot because they built the, the wall on the enemy side. See? And instead of walling the enemy out, they've walled God out. They've walled the Holy Spirit out. Okay? And they've walled themselves in with the enemy. Now the enemy is free to lie to them. All he wants. Okay? And they'll have trouble because of this wall, this shield they've built, this false shield. Okay? This false armor, not armor of God, but armor of self. Huh? That's grown up. All right, they've walled themselves in, okay, and now uh, the enemy can minister to them all he wants, you see? And in the process, he's created an isolation from community, an isolation from spirit-filled people, an isolation from God, okay? And the stronghold builds and builds and builds and builds. The more ideas that the person is fed, the more it builds, until they reach a point, and we've seen this in some people, okay, where they have trouble staying in contact with reality, see? Why? Because uh, they have had such an input of demonic reality, lies, okay? which is a false demonic reality. If you listen to the lie long enough, you start believing it, don't you? Have you all done that? Who here has not been in that situation? Raise your hands. Okay, I'm glad the spirit of truth prevails here. Okay? Okay? You see? Because of the fact, okay, that that's the mechanism by which it all happens, okay? It's a design, okay? And so uh, what, we, what you must understand is the purpose of the building up of the stronghold is for the enemy to design the person into the enemy's desire, the enemy's image and likeness of what the enemy wants them to be. Because Satan counterfeits everything Jesus does. The Holy Spirit in ministering to the person is doing it for what reason? The Holy Spirit is doing it for the reason of formation in Christ. Right? To form them into the image and likeness of what Christ wants them to be. Okay, but when the demonic stronghold is there, what the enemy is doing, counterfeiting everything Jesus does, the enemy is ministering to them, okay, to form them and shape them, mold them and make them into the image and the likeness of what Satan wants them to be, what the enemy wants them to be. See, it is the unholy counterpart of the Word of God. See, that's why Paul says, take every thought captive to Christ and cast down every vain imagination. Amen? We'll talk more about uh, uh, the dynamics of uh, uh, demonic strongholds uh, in our soul life and our thought life next week. Lord, we give you all the thanks, praise, and glory for this day and for the truth of your word and the prevailing of your spirit. 
and your people. We give you all the glory, the saints said in agreement. Amen. Anybody have any questions or comments they want to make? You want to... Paranoia is just part of that whole complex. Paranoia is first and foremost a spirit. Okay? And the question then arises is, well, is all paranoia a demonic spirit? No. Sure. Absolutely. And when a person gets a, a momentarily paranoid, uh, for instance, if they're on the uh, uh, 60th floor of a building, and they don't like heights, and they're looking down, and they get a little panicky or paranoid about it. Okay? And it's momentary. They get in the elevator, they go down to the ground floor, they walk out the building, and everything is fine. That's not demonic, is it? No. I'm talking about when stadium plants in your court pattern. Yes. When he starts to plan and things like, oh, they're really against you. You know, they never like you. Well, that's the point. That's a form of paranoia. Yeah, that's the point. I, yeah, that's the point I want to make to you. See, there, there are gradations. Okay? If one comes down from a building and everything goes away, that's just human fear that made them a little paranoid. Right? Okay. And if it's under the control of their will, that's not the mind. Okay? But when Satan starts lying, as you've given the example, okay, and he starts obsessing them over this person's against me, or if I do this, they're going to hurt me, or they're going to turn against me, or they're going to report me to the police, or they're going to do this, or they're going to do that. And the idea pattern serves to torment. Okay, you've got to, you've got to ask yourself the question, what does this serve to do against this person? serves to torment them, if, if it serves to imprison them, you see, to an idea, if it serves to imprison them to, against further action, if it serves to take away their freedom, if it serves to isolate them, okay, that gives you the witness that this is a bondage, okay, and particularly if it is not under the control of their will, okay, and it serves to Anybody else have a question or a comment to make? Because we, you know, in the intensity of the circumstance, you know, we get involved in the 
the situation. Okay? And if if something should come out of our mouth that's of us and not of the Spirit, and you see the person getting resistant, okay, the Holy Spirit will speak to you or he'll give you a check in your spirit. Don't go there. Don't go in that direction. Okay? Back off. You see? And then, you know, I've had the Spirit. You know, whenever I realize sometimes in ministry I've gotten into the flesh, the Holy Spirit is saying, back off. Don't, don't go there. Yeah, they're not ready. Don't go there. Okay? And you just yield and wait a moment for the Spirit to put something on your heart and you speak it. See, that's how you get out of that. You see, just be totally yielded to the Spirit. See, let Him move in you and through you. And when you do that, you, you'll generally find out that things will get better, you see, in, in that circumstance. Now, the other point is, never go into a counseling session where you're working in the soul life of another person with any preconceived idea of what you want to achieve. Because if it's you who wants to achieve it, then it's a ministry by the arm of the flesh. It's not a ministry by the spirit. So you may know what's wrong with this person. You may say, well, we've got to get rid of this and she's got to, she's got to start thinking this way and be more positive about it. Well, that's your solution to the problem. That may not be the Holy Spirit's solution to the problem because the Holy Spirit knows more about this person's heart than you do. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, who can know the heart of man except the Lord? The Lord searches the heart. Huh? Well, if it's the Lord who does it, you've got to be yielded to the Lord for the Lord to tell you what is the stronghold in this person's heart. See? Okay? Because otherwise you're ministering by the arm of the flesh. Okay? And the Holy Spirit won't be in it and it won't go anywhere. And you've also got to trust that by the time your session ends, you'll have a knowing from the Holy Spirit. Okay? That that's all he's going to do for today. It may be a half hour, it may be an hour, maybe two hours. You know, maybe longer. I don't know. The Spirit will put it on your heart. But the point I'm trying to make is that when uh, the session is over, okay, just be satisfied that the Holy Spirit accomplished what He intended to accomplish for that day. Because you're trusting on Him to do it. He's doing the ministry. Not you. Not me. You see? And that, you know, he brought everyone together for a purpose that day. And that he accomplished what was going to be done that day. And you may think that nothing was accomplished, but I promise you that if the Holy Spirit used you to speak truth to that person or the word to that person, seeds were planted in that person's heart. Okay? The very same heart from which the abundance of the mouth speaks. The negative things that build that stronghold. See? And those seeds are going to be watered by the Holy Spirit. And maybe that's all he needed for that day. You see? Until the next session or five sessions down the road. You see? Well, how many sessions do you have to have before all of this is over? I don't know. Because he's sad. He's sad. 
sovereign over people's circumstances. He's sovereign over their lives. He's sovereign uh, over their problems. He knew he brought them there for that day, and he intended to accomplish it, and I promise you he accomplished it, whatever it was. You see, maybe you don't know what it is, and maybe I don't know what it is. Okay? But we've had people come back where we have seen Yeah. 
Yeah. Any other questions? 